reduce by, from considerable efforts, protect the data from unfair commercial use. Considerable efforts we've demonstrated, it takes uh, you know, 10 years, 256 million, et cetera, on average to get, get this type of data together. Uh, protection from unfair commercial use, the normal way this data would be protected is that it's a trade secret. This, is a co this would be comparable to the Coke formula. Uh, but, unfortunately, because the ag chem industry and the pharmaceutical industry both are putting something that has the ability to be a toxin into the environment, we have an obligation around the world, in the U.S., everywhere, uh, to go to the national authorities and reveal this data. That's the only way they can tell that the, the compounds, the molecules are safe or efficacious and uh, of high quality. So as a result, we, in a sense, breach the trade secret provisions of TRIPS, which are 39.2 by definition. So we're under 39.3. And the compromise, the societal compromise that it has made around the world is that we, we reveal this data. The country keeps it confidential, and it will not re let anyone else rely on that data for a period of time. And the norm, as I've said, it's a, it's a norm that has been established by both the EU and the US. All of our free trade partners, the TPP negotiation is good getting a 10-year data protection for, right now it has for eight of the countries in the TPP, the remaining three are being uh, persuaded to uh, adopt 10 years. Uh, all of the free trade agreements that the US has adopted in the last 10 years have 10 years of data protection, CAFTA, Peru, Chile, Singapore, et cetera. Uh, and so that's the norm. It's actually somewhat less than the protection we provide here in the United States and in the EU. But what we provide is a basic 10 years and then an extra five with, with requirements. The requirements, though, would, it would mean that you need to have an infrastructure, a legal infrastructure that is capable of exercising the rights of those, those extra five years. Because the United States, it's basically a requirement that generic companies would pay compensation to the data owner, the data innovator, in, in return for being allowed to rely on it. At no time is there any reason that a generic company, a Me Too follow-on, could not come and generate their own data. But obviously, that's, they do not care to do that because of the cost. And you know the societal compromise has been, let's, let's say it's 10 years giving the innovator adequate time to recoup its R&D investment uh, and then allow others to rely upon it around the world. And so that's, that's why if you don't give some reasonable period of protection for giving away your trade secrets in this regard, in some sense we're maintaining that it is violative of 39.3. Thank you. Um, are Indian farmers being hurt because they don't have crop protection available by the market scene? Yes, Commissioner. We maintain they really are because the multinational corporations or others who have got the research abilities to create these innovative products, and there are some Indian companies that, that uh, provide are doing this now finally themselves, uh, are, are then, uh, in a sense, we have to make an economic, the companies have to make a, an economic decision. Do you enter into that society if the risk is that your proprietary data is going to either be one fully disclosed or at least made available to any other follow-on that comes and says, I want to rely on that data so I can have the same registration, the same license to sell. And my, my one example, which I'll provide with an independent study, you know, we, we compared the cotton farmers in Brazil versus India. And, uh, you know, it's not the only factor, which I, I would caution everyone, but the fact that Brazil has 10 years of data protection, India does not. Brazil, as a result, has 83 compounds available for farm, their Brazilian farmers to use to produce cotton. The, the Indians only have 35, and the facts speak for themselves in terms of productivity. The Brazilian farmers' uh, yields are 300 percent percent the, the uh, yield of the Indian farmers on 10 percent of the land that the Indian farmers have to devote to cotton. And that's because of the innovative intellectual property written type of uh, uh, you know, crop protection chemicals and, and, and technologies that are available. Great, thank you. I'm sorry, time's expired. Oh. 
wish to speak? Thank you all very, very much. And uh, to continue uh, the dialogue, th this might be um, uh, most uh, able uh, to be answered by, by Ms. Dempsey, uh, maybe Ms. Schroff or Mr. Summers, but, but really welcome input from anyone. Um, can you help us uh, uh, understand some facts uh, around the process of um, port entry into India, the, the physical steps involved. Uh, and so my, my guess is that manufacturers, of course, would experience this more, for example, um, uh, than others. Um, and, and in particular, trying to get a, you can imagine there being, you know, uh, an ordinary set of steps and an ordinary set of uh, um, uh, taxes and other uh, activities. But we're trying to get a sense of um, how systematized, how even the playing field is uh, for, for them. Uh, are there uh, delays? Are there uncertainties? Are there vagaries in the system, if you will? Um, do you have any sense of either that at the moment, or could, might you be able to provide that later? Thank you, Commissioner. Um, in, in the most general sense, yes, we've heard of you know significant um, slowdowns, inefficiencies, discrepancies, different treatment at ports, uh, customs processing in India. But let me go back to our broad membership and try to get some more detail on that. Um, it, it's definitely um, a problem there. There are a number of issues involved there, but let, let me try to put some more facts on it. Thank you. Please, uh, thank you. And Ms. Schwab? Uh, I think as far as the entry of foreign firms into India is concerned, I think for most of the sectors, you do not need any approval, at least of the government of India. Uh, you bring in the equity and uh, then you have to report back to the Reserve Bank of India, which is our central bank, within 30 days. It's just a reporting requirement, but not a prior approval. Yes, but I'm, as sorry, I'm thinking about physical. Right, so I, that's the first part of it. When you come to setting up a factory or a business in India, both the Indian companies and the American companies need exactly the same set of approvals for doing business in India. Most of these are known today. They're all on the websites. You can get down the forms. Yes, you have to understand what is actually required. So if you have somebody in India who's assisting you to do this, I don't think it's such a problem. Even if you ask Indian enterprises, they would need to understand what is required in those forms. But all of them are available today on the website. And the, well, the actual, actual physical doing business, the rules are the same for both. Just briefly, sir. Uh only 12 ports in India serving 1.24 billion people. So limitation on infrastructure is, is huge. Customs is different port by port. It's a challenge. Uh, Pallavi Shroff uh, suggested that freight forwarders can be very helpful getting you through that process. But it, it, it's a challenge getting stuff in. Uh, then there are state by state different octroys that occur given India's federal system. And hopefully that would get solved with the general services tax that the finance minister is trying to get implemented. But that's going to take two thirds of all Indian states to vote yes. It's going to be a major political hurdle to get over, not unlike the ones we see up on Capitol Hill. But, but to get something from Calcutta to Bombay, studies have been conducted that it literally takes as long as eight days. That's a long time to get uh, sensitive products from one, one side of the country to the other. Hey, with the right amount of snow, that's what it takes to get across DC. Uh, we at CII do support the introduction of the general goods and services tax. Maybe as a follow-up, then I, I wonder, and, and again, if this is not available today, that's fine. But maybe for later, is, is there? So of course, in India, um, it is relevant in part because of its internal. In India's market is relevant in part because of its internal market and population, but it's also relevant in part because of its presence in Asia. Uh, to what extent do you uh, uh, ship to, sell to uh, India, uh, to ship to or sell to Asia? And uh, to what extent do the 
Chinese activities in Sri Lanka to significantly invest in port <coughs> infrastructure, both in Colombo, the old port, and, and then the, the um, I, I guess, for lack of a better term, new old port uh, in, in uh, um, Hambantota, I guess it is, the, the, the large um, facility being reinvigorated. Uh, to what extent does that, do, do those uh, efforts um, divert uh, investment or, or trade uh, around India, if you will, uh, or are these just not big factors? That is a very difficult question. It's a complicated question. Um, the, the, the advent that we're beginning to see now is more and more American companies incorporating India into, into their global supply chains. Best example of that would be Ford's largest ever manufacturing facility outside of the United States in Gujarat. Automobile Penetration Commissioner in India is eight cars per 1,000 people. I would argue in the United States it's 995 cars per 1,000 people. So the growth in the domestic market by itself is a massive uh, opportunity and a huge demand. But nevertheless, Ford is looking to be able to use those facilities in Tamil Nadu and Gujarat to access that corner of Asia as a, as a new and emerging market opportunity. Um, in terms of Chinese kind of building this arc of uh, entry uh, portals throughout, uh, around the country, and I guess that's what you're, 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 you're kind of illustrating that, um, uh, India is concerned as we are about, about um, flooding the marketplace with, with Chinese equipment. I think the most important example there is BHEL, the domestic producer of boilers in India, Bharat Heavy Electric, uh, Electricals, uh, they, are, they are short on their order book right now, whereas what's happening is Chinese are selling supercritical boilers into India through any number of diff different locations. Uh, India needs 350,000 megawatts of new power. That's $350 billion worth of new equipment uh, by itself. And, and so we want to be part of that. And the companies like General Electric, of course, are, are very eager to be part of that. India is therefore, how do we adjust our, our, our entry strategy so as not to offend a strategic geopolitical engagement with China, which is in their interest, while also understanding that they have to protect uh, their own internal market as well as allow the best technology to come in through the West. Very complicated issues, but uh, I, I think the, the leadership of this government and previous governments have, have, been, have been seized of these issues particularly as China has grown stronger and more aggressive in the region. Uh, yes, if there were others who wanted to comment. If not, I'll yield the rest of my time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Shemchak, you made uh, several references to our earlier insurance study and the employment views that we saw. I was wondering if there's any additional or new information you might have about the employment impact both in the U.S. and India coming from, say, the restrictions, the limitations on foreign insurance firms to become, you know, to operate their own, run their own operations and things like that. I'm just trying to get an idea. We have to look at the economic impacts. And so I thought maybe if there is additional insight you want to give now or post hearing. I think I'll probably uh, have to do post hearing, Mr. Chairman. I, I was reviewing the report in preparation for my testimony and uh, not being an economist, I, I don't, I don't, uh, I couldn't reproduce the formula that that the ITC used, but I think it's excellent, and I would like to uh, uh, maybe take more up-to-date data and plug it back into that formula and see what comes out. I'd ha be happy to work with the ITC staff to get that data. And in addition um, to the sort of headquarters effect, I think there are also U.S. firms that are sort of provided shall we say, uh, not just insurance, but like uh, brokering services and things like that uh, to multinationals globally. Because I think, or there's one firm in Chicago that had about a thousand employees, and that I remember. And so, to what extent are there been employment impacts on so that wider 
sort of insurance-related firms. And then, again, if you have some examples of post it might be useful. Uh, yes, sir. Um, a lot of, there, there are restrictions in India on who can sell insurance. And so there are some restrictions that would limit the ability uh, of, uh, of U.S. Uh, agents, brokers, to operate in India. Now, I should add that I do not represent the agents brokers. They have a separate organization. But, um, but there, there's a great deal of what uh, in services trade lingo is called mode one cross-border uh, insurance trade. And a lot of that has to do actually with reinsurance, which has very sophisticated brokerage systems. Um, and in that sense, yes, there would be uh, employment in the U.S. from some of the large uh, uh, brokerages um, uh, to do with trade with India. Thank you. Uh, Sure. You're right, there are at least two that I can think of who are doing extremely well in their brokerage, U.S. brokerage firms. One is Marsh and the other one is Willis. Yeah, they're doing, well in they're doing extremely well in India and oh. doing a lot of business in India. Okay. Um, I was wondering if anyone um, wants to think of other services firms that are maybe affected by our services sectors that are adversely affected by you know, trader investment restrictions in India. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I understand that legal services is a very protected field in India, um, and I don't have background on that, because I, 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 but it might be a, a, of interest to the Commission to reach out to the APA or, or other organizations uh, representing the American legal services sector. Yeah. Allow me to say that I, I know that Pauli probably may disagree with me on this one, but I think the, the more we can push on the opening of the legal services sector in India, the more likely U.S. foreign investment will be going into India. People love to work with their own lawyers or law firms, and therefore the more U.S. Uh, law firms on the ground would be helpful. We're also worried about architects. Uh, lately, more and more, there's been U.S. architecture, architect firms trying to be involved. In, like India resisted the entry of the big four accounting firms in earlier years, there's now a concern from local architects that, hey, what are we doing Let's seeding all this opportunity to the, to the multinationals? So those two sectors need to be watched, uh, legal services and architectural firms. Uh, the, obviously, the accounting firms are now partnered up and they are very much involved in India and it has only been to the benefit of, of India's growth in its economy. So this is true, even though a lot of times those multinationals are going to be hiring Indian architects or Indian lawyers or... It would be, I mean, when you think about the, the, the accounting firms that are based in India, it's, it's all India. And it's, it's huge in the country. And look how it's, uh, it's promulgated fantastic investment for all, all different parties, domestic and foreign. I, th I think if I may just add, for the legal services in India, we need to amend the law, which means it needs to go to Parliament, which is uh, going to be one of the biggest hurdles that uh, is going to come in sort of even considering the opening of the legal services in India, because Parliament is very difficult to get a bill like this passed through Parliament. That raises the question about the, um, to what extent There's sort of discrimination at the subnational level and at the, in the states, and how important is that? Because I guess there are differences between states as to how open they are to foreign investment. Yeah, take your states carefully. It's a big country. Uh, I can name one state, uh, the state of Uttar Pradesh, with a population of 210 million people by itself. These are massive. Uh, almost the size of countries. Uh, but there are about eight to 10 very progressive states that are growing at double digit GDP. And those are the states that are attracting the bulk of foreign investment. And Mr. Chairman, that means that as those states begin to attract the most attractive investors, the other states are recognizing the need to reform. And so it's, it's almost like a magnet effect in a very positive way. Thank you. Um, I want to turn to some questions on the uh, back row. Mr. Lewis, are there international standards or international bodies that are recognized for you know, setting the standards in uh, clinical research? And to what extent 
do they help here? Or is it uh, yes, there are, and they, they help greatly. So there's the, uh, there are good clinical practices, GCP, put forward uh, by the International Conference on Harmonization. And those are uh, ethical standards and quality standards uh, that govern clinical research globally and that our members uh, adhere to strictly. There are variances, of course, country to country uh, uh, to adopt to regulations. But one of the advantages uh, of our industry is because we are operating all over the world, we operate to the same standards uh, all over the world. So there, there is that standard in place. I mean, I know it's difficult when you're dealing with yellow journalism, however, that yeah, kind of stuff, but it's it, it, it is. Um, that hasn't uh, made it easy, and I'd like to, to, uh, to that point, uh, address something that, that Ms. Shroff said. But, but first, um, uh, I also want to put India in perspective in terms of clinical trials. Uh, in the U.S., we have about 5% of the world's population, but 45 to 50% of clinical trials take place in the U.S. Uh, in India, at its peak, India accounted for about 3% of clinical trials globally, so this is not a a situation where there's been this massive exodus. It's, it's just the need to conduct, uh, the need to recruit patients globally and access the global population, the need to have data from many different populations, the need to eventually market these drugs in different countries that may want local data. So there are many reasons uh, to do trials all over the world. And I, I just want to be clear on that. This is a services industry. So I was wondering, what about the employment implications for the U.S. and for India of uh, the difficulty in conducting the trials there? Sure. Uh, our members employ about 100,000 um, researchers globally. Um, we had at one time about 3,000 or more in India. That has shrunken over the last, uh, over the last couple of years. Okay. So what about impacts in the U.S. in terms of money? Other than the law students and maybe the money, in addition to the power of the law students. Yeah, that's the, that's difficult because the as I mentioned in my testimony, the um, lack of research in India would would force those trials into other countries. So it's likely that some of that may come back to the United States, but it's, it's probably more likely that they would go to other parts of Asia or uh, or other geographies. Good. Thank you. Um, what uh, what about in the crop life barrier and biotech area in terms of international? recognized standards are bodies that, say a country like India might say, well, it's an international standard, so therefore we'll accept it, or as an international body where we were involved in making the rules. Is there a factor here? Sure, Commissioner. There's, there's one area that uh, is common throughout the world, and that's Codex Alimentarius, which are the international food standards. Uh, India is a party to those agreements, like, like all of us. Uh, they're designed to uh, set up, a, in, in, in terms of pesticides or crop protection chemicals, they're designed to set up what is called the maximum residue limit that would be allowed, the amount of residue of the pesticide allowed on the crop before it's uh, consumed. Uh, and that, that is an international standard. Uh, it's an international set of uh, individuals who meet every year in China and set new codex standards on, on individual crops, asparagus, Brussels sprouts, whatever. Uh, India is a, a party to that, and uh, the, the only question I wouldn't be able to answer right off the top of my head, maybe Ms. Schropp knows, is uh, I I if you don't set up your own country standard, a lot of countries around the world then adopt the codex standard. The US has its own standards, the EU has its own standards, but they correspond to the codex mm -hmm. standard. So, uh, but that is totally international. Uh, I think as far as the food and agribusiness is concerned, India is in the process of re-looking at the standards that it has and sort of meet them in line with the codex. So we have the new Food Safety and Security Agency, FSSAI, and uh, that whole process of re-looking at the law is in progress. Okay, thank you. Uh, answers. Uh, Commissioner Baker. Thank you. I just have a, a couple more questions. Um, First of all, uh, Mr. Simchak, what is the balance between uh, state level and federal level regulation of the financial products uh, that you're aware of in India? Insurance products in India are regulated at the federal level by the IRDA, the uh, Insurance Regulatory Development Authority. Um, 
So it, I, I believe it's it's entirely at the federal level. Are there any state level policies that uh, that affect uh, the industry? You, you said that the regulations at the federal level, but are there any state level policies that you might be concerned about? It hasn't come up in my discussion with my members, but uh, I will check and, and get back to you. Thank you. I, I saw you now. No, I think strong. to the best of my knowledge, there are no state level policies. Uh, most financial regulator, financial services, or in, including insurance, pensions, everything is regulated only by a federal legislation. Federal legislation. Thank you. Now, is there anybody on the panel who can speak to the regulation of nutraceutical products uh, in India? I think that, if I may uh, attempt. Uh, I think that has been a very vexed question in India and recently we've had seen where the line between nutraceutical and pharmaceutical is sought to be blurred. So there is, you need to get a product approval under our legislation and when you go for product approval, uh, we find that there's a, very, there's a uh, technical evaluation by scientists and the line between the nutraceutical and pharmaceutical is a little blurred as of the moment. Thank you. Anybody in the back row want to comment on that? It may combine some of your areas of interest. We'll get back to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Summers, uh, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Johansson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would like to uh, follow up a question along the line of questions that the, the, the Chairman Williamson was, at, was uh, asking before. And this is for Mr. Lewis and also for Mr. Smallman and, and Mr. Nelson. Uh, India has a large educated population. Um, aren't Indian officials concerned about the winding down of clinical research trials? Uh, and also, as I believe Mr. Lewis mentioned, this, could, this that type of situation can have harm on public health overall. And also, you had mentioned that the shutting down of a quintile facility in the state of Hyderabad. Uh, and I would assume that, they, that government officials would be concerned about that type of action. I, I would say that we have seen limited concern uh, from government officials on, uh, on the current state. Uh, as I mentioned, the issues have become highly political. So while there are certainly uh, concerned parties within the Ministry of Health uh, and elsewhere in the Indian government, I think they are, uh, at the moment, uh, pretty quiet voices um, as this, as this uh, issue has bubbled up. Why, why would they be quiet voices? I know in the United States that if an industry is on is on the wane, that many of us up here on the on, on the commission to work on Capitol Hill, that that type of situation usually usually catches the attention of government officials, and they want to try to improve the situation. We have not seen um, really any level of government support for uh, for the industry, and I could. Not being an expert in internal Indian politics, I would only ascribe that to the to the political environment. And I'll give uh, one example back to uh, a comment uh, Ms. Shroff made earlier on the um, just an example of how uh, out of sync some of the reporting and some of the politicalization has come of, of the clinical trials issue. The uh, HPV vaccine. Uh, example that she alluded to was actually not a clinical trial, although it was uh, portrayed that way uh, in, in India. It was a test of, it was not a test, it was a vaccination program of Gardasil and, and another HPV vaccine that are approved and administered all over the world. It was administered by PATH, which is a global health organization funded by the Gates Foundation. Um, and yet that was uh, 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 portrayed as a clinical trial, and most of the allegations of, of wrongdoing in that case were, were later debunked. So that's the environment we're operating in. All right, thank you for your information there. Ms. Shroff, would you like to comment? Uh, yeah, I think uh, this whole sort of winding down or slowing down of clinical trials is probably a temporary process. It's more because of the injunctions that the Supreme Court has granted, and as a result, everybody's sort of backing off from doing the trials, not knowing when that case might finish or what would be the outcome of the case. Though it's, since it's in the nature of a public interest litigation that uh, the court is entertaining, it's going to be more a collaborative process where the government will have to come out with regulations. And this is a time where the 
US companies can participate in the rule making.